If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open them at our passage that we looked at earlier, Matthew 21. As we look at it together. In the diverse cultures of our world, certain things carry a symbolic meaning that is not necessarily evident to people of another culture. Take, for instance, our small province here in Northern Ireland. At a certain time of year, namely what is called the marching season, if a man is seen riding down the road atop a white horse, dressed in 17th century clothing, equipped with a period musket and sword, people from here will more often than not make the connection with King William of Orange and the Battle of the Boyne, or as a visitor to these shores. Someone who is not therefore acquainted with our history, our traditions, may not automatically see the symbolism and just assume that it's some guy overdoing the fancy dress and want to know where the party is. In a similar fashion, when we read the Bible, because we are separated by time and culture, we often fail to pick up on the symbolism contained in certain passages that first century readers and actual eyewitnesses of the events would have spotted straight away. And one such passage is the one we're looking at today, Matthew's Gospel account of Jesus entering Jerusalem. Up until this time, Jesus, with the odd exception of getting in a boat, had traveled everywhere on foot, but on this particular day, he requisitioned a donkey and rode it into Jerusalem. To us, a donkey is not particularly noteworthy, until you realize that the revered King David rode a mule as his royal mount. Nor was it just any old donkey. It was unbroken, that is to say, it had never been ridden before. So aside from the miraculous ability to ride a donkey that had never been ridden before, the message being conveyed here is, no one but the king can ride his royal mount. With Jesus' reputation, the symbolism of this was not lost on the people converging on Jerusalem for the Passover festival. As we can see from the reaction in verse 8, we're told that they spread their cloaks on the road. Thus, they were repeating history. In 2 Kings 9 and 13, we're told that when the army commander Jehu had been anointed king of Israel by the prophet Elisha, his fellow officers spread their cloaks on the ground in front of him. Verse 8 also tells us that other people cut, palm, uh, cut branches, which Luke's gospel tells us that were palm branches. And these were spread on the road in front of him also. This again was something that their forefathers had done. When Simon Maccabeus had liberated Jerusalem from the hated Greek rulers back in the year 165 BC, they also referred to Jesus as the son of David. Make no mistake about it. These people, excited by what some of them had seen and others had heard about Jesus and his miracles, were welcoming him as their king, the long-awaited, long-hoped-for Messiah. But unfortunately, their idea of a Messiah was vastly different from reality. They wanted a military and political Messiah to free them from the yoke of Roman rule, but Jesus had come to do something vastly different. He had come to defeat a far deadlier foe. So you see, Jesus was making a statement here that he knew everyone of Jewish origin would pick up on. Without words, he was saying, I am your king. But as I've already said, his kingship was vastly different from what the people expected it to be. So with Christ's kingship in mind, as I want us to consider what this account from Matthew tells us about his kingship. First of all, Matthew tells us that Jesus was a promised king. We learn this from verses 4 to 5. Therein, speaking of Jesus riding into the city on a donkey, Matthew said, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey, which William read to us earlier also. And as William alluded to, this is part of a prophecy from, of, by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9 and verse 9, to be precise. He was not the only prophet to prophesy about Jesus, but he prophesies a lot about him. And this particular prophecy is part of a larger prophecy. It speaks of God delivering his people from oppression. 
the verse immediately prior to the one that Matthew quotes says, I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Since the fall of Samaria to the Assyrians in 721 BC and Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 BC, the Jewish people had been subjected to domination by one foreign ruler after another with only a brief spell of independence before the mighty Roman Empire took charge of the region. But 500 years before this event, 500 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that day, God had promised through Zechariah of a king to deliver them. Jesus was that promised king. There are many people who today, today who, whilst they acknowledge the existence of Jesus, do not believe that he was anything other than a man with some admirable character traits who also happened to have or also happened to be a very gifted teacher. But they could not be more wrong because there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament related to Jesus Christ. The very first one being in Genesis 3.15, where immediately after our first parents had sinned, God in his mercy spoke about one who would come and defeat Satan. Then as the Old Testament continues, so does the messianic thread, with prophecy after prophecy pointing to a coming Messiah, each one conveying a little bit more information about him, like the pieces of a puzzle which, when fitted together, provide us with a picture of him, his ancestry, the circumstances of his birth, the place of his birth, the characteristics of his reign, the re his rejection and death, and a whole lot more besides. These were all foretold. The possibility of us being able to fulfill just one prediction <clears throat> that someone else made about us hundreds of years ago are, humanly speaking, impossible. Yet Jesus Christ fulfilled all these prophecies down to the last detail. You know, there are some people, even professing Christians, who believe that the Old Testament is no longer relevant. How, long, how wrong they are. But the Old Testament reveals all that we need to know about God and likewise all that we need to know about ourselves, that we are a sinful people deserving of his righteous judgment. And if that is all it told us, it would be a very depressing read. But God, in being gracious and merciful towards us, reveals through his word the coming Savior, a king whose purpose was to rescue us from the consequences of our sin. It points to Jesus as that promised king. But of course, we know that the people that day caught up in the excitement automatically assumed that he was very different. That he was a different king. That he was, came to defeat the Romans and to give them their independence back. Alas, they were mistaken. Because although he was the promised king, he had a mission that was vastly different to their expectation. Because you see, whilst he was the promised king, he was also a servant king. Addressing God's people, Zechariah said, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. Note that this sovereign is described as your king. We might not necessarily see significance in this, but herein God is promising that this long-awaited king would not be another foreign ruler, nor would he be someone coming to reign for his own purposes. He was coming to benefit his people, not himself. Then to reinforce this point, the king is described as gentle and riding on a donkey. Now the Greek word for gentle can be also just translated as humble or considerate, which is not something you would automatically assume a king to be. But you see, this king was not going to reign by brute force, nor was he going to be a burden upon his subjects. He had come to free them. Jesus had come as king to serve his people, not to be served. This is something that he had already alluded to, for in Matthew 20 and verse 28 he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ had not come to evict the Romans, but to die at their hands for them and for humanity. He, did, he came not to engage the Romans in armed struggle, but to provide a means by which sinful humanity could be reconciled to a holy God. He did not do this by coming to act as a negotiator between God and man. 
He came to pay the price of sin himself, to die and face the wrath of God himself, to pay a debt he did not owe for those who owed it but had no hope of paying it. That is the ultimate form of service, to die for others, to lay down your life in order to spare theirs. Jesus Christ did that for us. He did not just come to serve the people alive in Palestine back then. As 1 Peter 3.18 reminds us, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He suffered once for sins, once for all time. So Christ's sacrifice was on our behalf as well. You know, there is an irony in this story. <clears throat> In that immediately prior to it, Matthew tells us how Jesus had restored the sight of two blind men. The irony lies in the fact that these men, though blind, knew the wretchedness of their condition and sought out the only one who could heal them. But then here Jesus is confronted with people who, though they have physical sight, are actually blind. They could not see who Jesus really was and thus were blind to their real need. They wanted to see it from one thing, Roman rule, but at the same time they failed to see that they had a far greater need. The need to be reconciled to God. In short, the need to be saved. I wonder, does that reality still escape you? Are you so caught up in the moment of the here and now that you cannot see what lies beyond the shores of this physical life here on earth? Thus you cannot see your need to be saved. As you read about Jesus here, do you see him as the servant king who came to serve you in the way that he did? Do you even see your need of Jesus Christ to serve you in this way? Or are you still blind to the message of God's word, the good news of the gospel? Jesus was a promised king who came as a servant king, as Luke's gospel tells us, He came to seek and save the lost. But these are not the only aspects of his kingship revealed to us here by Matthew. Because within these verses, we also get a glimpse of him as a victorious king. (coughs) Caught up in the moment, the crowd threw their cloaks as well as cut palm branches on the road and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As verse 9 tells us. Now, Hosanna is a Hebrew expression meaning save or save now. In modern context, we might say, save us now. But the second sentence in this verse is another direct quotation from the Old Testament. Psalm 118, verse 26 to be precise. Which, if you look it up, you will note is preceded by, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. So you can begin to get a flavor of what the people's aspirations were. They were expressing both a heartfelt request and a proclamation of praise by virtue of the fact that the one to whom the appeal was made was believed to have the ability to deliver what they wanted. We again may not automatically pick up on this, but that line from verse or from Psalm 118 that they shouted reveals whose authority they believed Jesus had come with, namely God's. You don't hear such phraseology now. But if you have ever seen some of the old movies set in Elizabethan or Tudor England, for example, when servants of the sovereign were appointed by by that sovereign to carry out a task, such as to investigate something or to arrest someone, they would sometimes be heard to say, in the name of Queen Elizabeth, I arrest you. Or in the name of King so-and-so, I declare such and such. In the name of is another way of saying that you act with their authority. In affairs of the state, this means that such a person has the legal powers of the person whose name they are acting. So in coming or so coming in the name of the Lord has far greater connotations because of God's sovereign power and authority. Jesus Christ came with all the power and authority of the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth which no power on earth or in the entire universe can match or withstand. We catch but a very small glimpse of this in the miracles that Jesus was able to perform 
where even nature listened to his voice and obeyed his commands. He came with such power and authority because he was both truly God and truly man. Does not John's gospel teach us this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus Christ was Emmanuel, God with us. If there is any doubt about Jesus' power and authority, one needs only to look at what happened to him in the days after this event. Within a week, the majority of these people who had nailed him as their king or healed him as their king were shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And when he was crucified, it looked like he had failed. When his body, bruised and bloodied, was laid to rest in the tomb, but three days later, that very same tomb was empty. To prove that far from being vanquished, he was victorious. In rising from the grave, he dealt a decisive blow against Satan, fulfilling the promise made all those years ago to Adam and Eve. By breaking the curse of sin, death itself, he rose victorious from the grave. So you see, the people on that day were, without even knowing it, healing a victorious king who would have, who would have complete and final victory over sin and his penalty death. They were unknowingly having a pre-victory celebration. But you know, as we consider Jesus in this moment, as he rode into Jerusalem gentle and riding on a donkey, let us not forget that whilst at present he is seated at the right hand of the Father, one day he will return to reign unopposed. But when that day comes, he will not be riding upon a donkey. And he will not be coming to serve humanity by laying down his life. He'll be coming to judge all those who have rejected him. Writing in Revelation 19, the aged apostle John had a vision of that day. And therein we read, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Make no mistake, that will be a terrible day for all who have rejected Christ. That is to say, those who have rejected the means of salvation that he provides. For having rejected him as their saviour, they will have no option whatsoever but to accept him as their judge. So having seen what picture or what scripture reveals to us, my question to you here today is, have you greeted Jesus as the humble, gentle king riding on a donkey? who died for you? Have you accepted him as your Savior and Lord, or have you rejected him as many of the people in this story did? Have you dismissed him as being irrelevant and unneeded by you? Because if you have, you will have no option but to meet him in the future as the victorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords when he returns at the end of the age. In short, will you accept him now as your saviour or later as your judge? Jesus Christ was the promised king. He was a servant king who came to seek and save the lost and in that he is a victorious king. No one who trusts in the Lord will ever be put to shame. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he was long promised. We thank you, Lord, that he came as a servant king. And we thank you, Lord, that he is a victorious king. For only he has the power to wash us clean. 
to cleanse us from all our sins that we can stand before you without spot or stain upon that day. Lord, help us to accept him as our saviour this day. For it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.